Thank you very much, Bob. It's lovely to be here. Bob is a, a graduate from the university here from 1963, so good 50 years. And uh, he was telling me this morning how very different campus looked, obviously, back then, just JHE and was, was around and a few of the other buildings on campus. And it's, uh, it's interesting how Bob's career has been growing as well over that period of time. He's started a company, Natural Chemistry, and this company is produces enzymes and products for contaminants, cleanup, phosphate removal. It does, uh, has products related to flea and tick removal. Actually, this is a, probably a talk that my separations class should be listening to rather than. Right. So, but engineering economics, problem solving, entrepreneurship is a theme that comes through um, this 4M course uh, when I've taught it in the past. We've had speakers talk about startup companies. And for the last two thirds of Bob's career, he started up this company and grown it to where it is today. Um, he's going to tell you some fascinating stories of how that's happened over the past almost 25 years it's coming up to um, So for a company to keep going, it started for 25 years is a phenomenal success. Um, Bob has told me you have to ask questions in between, and if you don't, he's going to. So um, you, uh, it, it's an interactive talk. There's no PowerPoint. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a discussion between colleagues and for us to get an understanding of what it means to be an interpreter. Thank you all. Thank you, Evan. And good morning to you all. Good morning. Good morning. I hope this uh, is your second class, not your first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as, as Kevin mentioned, uh, I, I started to put a, a PowerPoint together for this, and then I recognized, hey, I want to have a discussion with you. And you're free to answer questions at any time, so I'm going to speak ex tempore. Um, the idea is that if you ask a question that I can answer in, you know, appropriate time, in, in the 45 minutes that I've got, I'll do it. And if you answer a question that I don't want to, or you ask a question that I don't want to answer, well, then I'll talk it, you know, I'll just tell you, I'll give you the answer at the tail end. But you'll know I'm talking to you. <laughs> Anyway, um, but I, I'd like everybody to be relaxed. This is, this is just a, a tale of, of uh, how one, by the way, I understand there are 150 graduating engineers or chemists this year. When I graduated in 63, there were three of us. And that was from the original 13. That's how many started out. And three of us, now one guy was delayed one year, and he graduated the next year, so it was four out of 13. Um, not an easy course, I'm sure you all know that, but you will profit greatly from having taken it. Okay, so remember, feel, just be relaxed, and if you wanna ask, ask me a question, there's no question too dumb, or, you know, whatever. You can just ask me any question you want. I'll, I'll try and answer it. Okay. Now, the first thing, the, the title of this talk, if you will, is Entrepreneurship in Chemical Engineering. Now, chemical engineering is a wonderful field from which to become an entrepreneur. Not necessarily when you graduate. Uh, because you're going to work on things uh, that uh, are bigger than, than maybe an entrepreneur can handle. But with time, there will be opportunities presented that may or may not be really useful as an entrepreneur. Um, so the first thing to realize is that not everybody um, should or could become an entrepreneur. Um, there, I mean, and there's no harm in that. Um, it's just, you know, some people like to poke around, start things up, and make things go. And some people like to have more uh, conformed, uniform work to do where they can make a major contribution and and contribute to society. So, you know, the, the idea here is um, to sort of give a little insight into uh, 
maybe the kind of person that wants to be an entrepreneur initially. Now, personally, uh, from the time I was a kid, I, I was born 72 years ago, and um, my parents were immigrants, and they were strivers. And what's the definition of a striver? A person who shows up with nothing and just works their butt off to improve their lives and the lives of their family. And that's what my parents did. And they ended up dying. Um, not rich people, but definitely solidly upper middle class. Um, now what did that do to me? Well, if your parents are striving, they would like you to strive too. So when I was nine years old, they came up with the idea that I should have a paper room. I lived in Niagara Falls, Ontario. And so you could go down and have a, an interview with the manager of circulation, Mr. Lummy. So my mother got this great big parka, because I was pretty small. And she got this great big parka to make me look bigger. And I went down and sat in front of Mr. Lundy, and he uh, gave me a paper route, and I started from there. So from the time I was nine to the time I entered this august institution, I always had jobs. I, and some of them involved being an entrepreneur. I sold shoes on the weekends. And I worked for a company called Agnew Surpass, and there was a deal. Uh, Agnew Surpass had, if, if they introduced some shoes and they didn't go well, well then they would sell them back to the manager of the store. They're, these shoes are called Spiffs. And they would sell them back to the uh, store manager for 20% of the face. So, it was a $30 pair of shoes, the store manager paid six bucks. And then, if you were a shoe salesman and you sold a pair of those spiffs, you got from 10 to 20% of the face value of the sale. So you can imagine, if you came into my store, the first place I was going to go to try and fit you was the spiff section. Because I could sell you a pair of shoes for $30, and I might make from $3 to six dollars for selling that pair of shoes. And when you're making 85 cents an hour, three bucks is a lot of money, you know? So, so that's sort of the, the background in terms of myself personally that I brought into um, chemical engineering. Uh, and as I went along, now I, I started off working uh, for a large corporation, Union Carbide Corporation. Um, when I graduated from McMaster, I had interviewed. It was not hard to get a job as a chemical engineer at that time. But the jobs available in Canada were primarily in the petroleum industry, uh, in a refinery. Uh, or in the paper industry, had a paper. So I went and interviewed two or three of these um, potential jobs. Uh, I had good grades, and I was, uh, you know, I had the qualifications to be a junior engineer at any one of these facilities. But they really didn't appeal to me. So I lived at the time. <coughs> all my life, really, in Niagara Falls, Canada. And I had some friends who worked in the United States and I and, and were engineers, and I considered that they were probably having a lot more fun than I might have working out in the boonies. So I, I just showed up, knocked at the door, said, well, here I am. Um, would you consider me for a job in chemical engineering? And I got a job in, at uh, a division of Union Carbide called the Linney Division in um, Honolulu, New York, the suburb of Buffalo. So, great. Um, I made a hell of a lot more money than I was going to make uh, if 
I had that job in the paper mill. But not only that, I had access to a lot more technology, and I was really interested in it. And one of the first lessons I learned, and it's important as an entrepreneur, is everybody that supports whatever enterprise you're doing is really important and deserves a great deal of respect. From the person that sweeps the floor to the person that is the technician running your pilot. And uh, here's an example of this that I have lived with all my life and I have told to countless people. Um, we were working on a process back then called the ISOCIT process. It was a process that converted normal paraffins into food, into protein. And the Russians were really interested in it because they had vast amounts of petroleum and they didn't have enough food. So the idea was that you would separate in the isocyst unit the feedstock into normal and isoparaffins. And the normal paraffins then became the feedstock for this uh, process. So we had, uh, I mean, this was a multi, multi-year project. And um, we would run from time to time this uh, pilot unit, which was a big pilot unit. It was three stories high, and uh, I mean, it was heavily instrumented, etc. And there was an engineer in charge for each shift, a junior guy like me. And then there were two or three technicians that took all the readings and made all the adjustments, etc. And I can still remember the very first time I was put in charge of this. Uh, there were two other engineers, and I knew them. One of them was a guy who really probably overestimated his capabilities. And he sat his technicians down beforehand and said, you know, I'm the engineer. You're the technicians, I call the shots, and don't forget. I sat my technicians down, and I said, you're the technicians. You know 10 times more about running this unit than I do. So, you know, come to me when there's a question, but you guys, you're in charge of running. Well, the unit broke down routinely when this other engineer, routinely, I mean every shift, it ran flawlessly because these people were committed to doing the job right, they had respect, and that was it. And I, I lived the rest of my career that way, and I, if, I, if you guys get any message from from this talk, it's whoever is part of the team, treat them as though they're a part of the team. Okay. Now, uh, I was going to give a brief in introduction to myself. I've done a little bit of that. Um, I graduated 50 years ago. Um, I worked for many years. Uh, for a large corporation. Eventually, uh, the fact that I liked to run businesses became the overwhelming portion of, of what I did in my career. So I started to run various businesses for Union Carbide. Uh, I ran the molecular sieve business. Have any of you um, familiar with synthetic zeolites? Okay, well I I was in charge of the worldwide molecular business for a number of years. Uh, I had plants in China, in Italy, in Mobile, Alabama, the really biggie. Um, and, and then I branched off into strategic planning um, and became Carbide's sort of head of strategic planning. Well, a number of years. And then finally they said, okay, 
you think you're pretty hot stuff, we're going to give you a, a really big business to run. It's a camp. You're going to go and run the Lindy Division, which is the Industrial Gas Division, which was at the time, now it's Praxair. Um, you're going to get a chance to run that. But by the way, they've got a welding products group that's been losing money for years. They've got a research group that hasn't been very productive. But go and see what you can do with it. Well, I took the strategic planning capabilities that I had learned. And in one year, I took that business. It was about a 20 to $25 million division. Divisions weren't very big then. And took it um, to losing about $2 million at the net income line per year to making about three. Um, and that sort of made my reputation within Union Carbide because then I was given many, I was given turnaround shots. You know? um, and it turns out that turning around a business is not much different than running a business just properly. Um, you, go, you, you do a strategic plan, you involve all of your, your uh, employees, and together you figure out, you know, the first thing you figure out is, am I losing money because I've got, I'm running a great business in a crappy industry, or am I losing money because I'm running a crappy business in a really good industry? And that's the first thing you've got to know. And, and that's really something for you guys, and, and by the way, I'm a company guy. I just, it's a generic term. No offense to the female persons here. Uh, but anyway, um, that's the first question you've got to ask yourself when you look at any opportunity. Uh, can I run this well and is the environment good? Now, at the time, before I got this business, Human Carbide had a metals division. And we were competing with government. Um, and we, had, we had huge operations in South Africa. Well, the South Africans weren't interested in making money from their metals businesses. They were interested in employing people. We were interested in making some money. Well, that was a $1 billion business that was just sucking up cash and had to go. And it went. Um, and there are numerous other examples. So anyway, I ended up, they said, okay, you're kind of an entrepreneurial guy. And if we were going to buy some businesses, we actually have one or two businesses already. One of them was the molecular synth business. That if we could stick some other stuff onto it, they would be the kind of business we'd go out and pay $100 million for. So they said, OK, I was, I was working in Toronto at the time. You come back and you become the vice president and general manager of the molecular sin business, and what we were giving you carte blanche. You can buy businesses, you can sell them, but just make this into something that works. So, uh, with that mandate, uh, over a five year period, I bought a major catalyst company called Catalystics. Uh, located in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, that had some innovative um, technology for the fluid cat cracking of petroleum into gasoline. Essentially, all the gasoline that you have right now, anywhere in the world, 85 to 90 percent of it comes from fluid cat crackers. And natural and carbide was the very first company to introduce zeolite catalysts for fluid cat fraction. They blew it because they didn't get the right patents. And it was worth tens and tens of billions of dollars. 
and we used to get a million dollars or two a year in royalty from all these petroleum companies that were making billions of dollars from our inventions. So we invented some new fruit cat crackers, cat cracking catalysts, and I decided, you know what? We need to own a cat cracking catalyst company. And we'll go out and license this to um, various uh, petroleum companies like BP, you know, all, all the big ones. And we were reasonably, reasonably successful at that. To the point that uh, we built it up into about a $300 million a year entity. But the really important part is it was making about one third of all the money. Union Carbide at that time was a $10 billion a year corporation. And my little division was making one third of all the earnings. Now, we had a, a competitor. It was the UOP division of Allied Signals. And they also had about a $300 million division. And it was making a ton of money, too. So we decided, well, we better go and acquire them. And we tried. Then they decided, well, they better try and acquire us. <laughs> and they tried. Uh, and then finally, Cooler has prevailed. And we decided to do a joint venture. Um, and that took about a year and a quarter to put together. But it was, pro it was at, at the era of joint ventures. But you know what? If you picked up Union Carbide's annual report for years after, and UOP's annual report for years after for Allied Signals, the first page was always devoted to this joint venture because it made so much money. And it was so powerful in the area in which it operated. Now, that's what made me a true entrepreneur. Because I was offered um, the job of the executive vice president of that corporation. It was a 50-50 joint venture, just like California. And, um, I said I didn't want that. Um, I was going to have to move to Chicago. I'm, a, I'm an East Coast boy. Uh, I live in Manhattan right now. Um, I like to be near water. And uh, I didn't want to be in the Midwest. And that, that's just a personal sort of thing. Um, so one thing led to another. Uh, Unique Carbide gave me a great golden handshake. And uh, I left to really either find another division or another business to run, or ultimately to start my own company. Well, and here's where the entrepreneurship part starts. I discovered this technology was natural enzymes. Now, I don't know whether any of you know anything about natural enzymes, but they're, they they just speed up processes that occur in nature naturally, but they accelerate them by sometimes thousands of times. So I came across a product that would degrade oils, greases, other impurities, just in a twinkle, you know, in in a, in a few hours versus weeks and weeks and weeks. And I decided you could build a business around this. And I was able to license that technology at a very reasonable cost. So I started natural chemistry. That was, that was what got me going as a true entrepreneur. I had this a little bit of seed money from Carbide. I had been successful as an executive for a number of years, so I had a lot of toys. I ended up with none of those toys. Now, here's the other really key part about being an entrepreneur, which you all need to understand. It ain't easy. Um, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, 
you're going to have some sleepless nights, some nights where you're worried about making payroll. I had those. Um, and you're always going to be initially short of money until you get some traction and you get something going. Um, in my case, uh, I learned very quickly, natural enzymes do so many things. So I was shooting at multiple targets. And I said, whoa, i got to find something where the product that I have can be dominant in the industry. And that happened to be the pool products. We, some of our products are used, well, the bulk of them are used in swimming pools and spas sold all throughout North America. You can't go into any good pool and spa shop and not get, not have <coughs> our products available. And uh, I used to do a demo in which I said to people, okay, um, I, can, I can guarantee that if you run your pool using some of these natural enzymes, you still have to sanitize your pool and, and all that you'll use a lot less of everything. But the one thing you won't have is the ring around the collar. You know how in swimming pools you get um, you get scum lines? Not if you use natural chemistry. They just disappear and if you use the product on a, on a maintenance basis, they never come back. And that eventually gave us some traction and I used to give an example. Uh, I used to say to the audience, I would be speaking to maybe 50 or 100 people who were interested in buying the product at some sort of cool school. I used to say, okay, I'm a chemical engineer. So I've got this product. It's not an acid. You can actually administer it to the pool by just pouring it over your head and letting it trickle down. That wouldn't make you very smart, but you could do it because it's completely harmless. But as a chemical engineer, I would think that to destroy all that scum and all that, all those problems, you would need to put something in the pool that is really harmful and toxic to human beings. But here's this product. You could drink it. You'd have diarrhea. <laughs> That's what would happen. Nothing worse than that. Okay? So, and that was my idea. Okay, I can take natural products, natural things that are non-toxic, friendly to the environment, and I can make them do things that uh, other really toxic products, things that are not good for the environment, they will do. That started natural chemistry. We went through all the phases of starting a company that you can go through. Be partially bankrupt. That was for a number of years, and those are the hardest years. To um, possible short sale, you know, in other words, it's going well, but still don't have enough <coughs> to finally after about 10 years the banks are knocking on the door say hey you need money come on just take a couple of million <laughs> you know, um, it's it I mean it's it's amazing the way it goes when you need the money uh, when you have the germ of the idea it's very hard to get um, when you are successful I mean we we borrow money right now. We still have a revolving line of credit. Uh, we're about a $30 million, $30, $35 million a year company. Um, we borrow money at prime minus a half. We're happy to get it. Um, so, what about, I'm going to look at my notes here. Because, yes. There, there, it's necessary to have 
either the right amount of funds lined up for your idea and have a realistic uh, idea of what resources it's going to take. How many people do you need? How many people do you need to start? Um, and so forth. Uh, and don't be grandiose about it. Uh, I used to brag to the bankers when they came in. You know, when we were finding a substantial company, um, you could look at our offices. We had 10 or 12 people in that particular office. I said, take a look at all the furniture. Our total investment in this furniture from the start of the company to the present is $500. We just got people who hand me down rejects. It didn't matter how you looked. It mattered that you had the funds to, to implement your strategies, your marketing strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we have a little better furniture, maybe worth $1,000. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's not the name of the game. The name of the game is to make your your company successful in the marketplace. So the first thing you have to do is you have to have an idea or a product, this is key, that you can manufacture, that you can get the intellectual property to protect it. And that's really important. I, I just had to stress that more. I mean, we have now 10 or 15 key products in our company. And we have a really large customer, um, we have many, many, thousands of customers, but this really large customer takes about 10 or 12 million dollars for the product per year. 99.5% of the products of ours that they sell are protected by intellectual property that's rock solid or by trademarks, etc. If you, if you start a company that manufactures something, it, 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 Canada and the United States, people are going to look at you and say, gee, that's a great idea. I'll do that too. And then the next thing you know, uh, you go from being a specialty product to a commodity, and then there's just no money left over at the end of the, you know, at the end of the week. So, Always, you have to create value. It has to be something that, that is timely, that the, that the consumer will react to. I'm, I'm talking about companies like ours. Um, and that you can protect. Because believe me, this customer of ours, they make a ton of money on the product, but if they could knock it off, they would in a second. Um, and you want to always make sure you have the funds necessary. You know, as you as you go along uh, and you become a little more successful, funds become more available. Always maintain control. I have a number of friends who have started companies where initially they owned 100 percent of the equity. And now the companies are hugely successful, but in order to keep the companies going, to get the funds, they just kept giving away the equity. Equity is the most expensive <coughs> form of funding you can get. Even if it's high interest rate debt, you end up paying it off, but you still own the equity. I still own 51% of natural chemistry. Even though I restructured it about three years ago, and this gets back to my initial comment on employees. Uh, Ten years ago or so ago, I had some real problems um, with the plumbing around my heart, and I had to have open heart surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And I really couldn't do all the things that was necessary to run now 
uh, a burgeoning business. But I had some people who just were young Turks, just like a lot of you and me in this room, and they could do it. And so I felt, and I still do, that I got the company to a certain point, and then they were going to take it to the next point. So what I did is I bought back all of the stock from all of the initial investors. I call legacy investors. This cost about three and a half million dollars. They made a ton of money on their, you know, fifty thousand dollar, thirty thousand dollar investments. And then I reestablished the company as a as a limited partnership. Took the core business and put a fence around it, and it's just it's a holding company. And, um, and I redistributed all that equity as under phantom equity plans to all the employees. You cannot be, and this goes back to respecting your employees and expecting them to go the extra mile for you. There is not an employee in natural chemistry that has worked there for more than a year. They have to work there for a year. That doesn't own a piece of the rock. So when we decide to monetize the company, I can sell it or do, do something with it, they're all going to be really smiling instead of walking around with very long faces because they will have a part of the equity and we structured it so the equity, even in Canada, will be subject only to long-term capital gain. So the maximum amount of, of, uh, of uh, and this was really took some doing, but the maximum amount of, uh, of, of taxes anybody's going to pay on their gain is 17%. So when you consider in Canada that you pay right now 53 and change, okay. excuse me, I'm getting drunk. <laughs> So, now, always be open. It doesn't matter whether you invented the technology or somebody else did. Can you license it? Can you buy it? Uh, we own, I don't know, 14 or 16 patents. Now, six or eight of those are mine, which I have assigned to. The rest, we purchased. When they were, and we become known as an innovator in the industry, so people have great ideas, they bring them to us. And we often do deals like, uh, we have a, comp a product right now that's going like gangbusters. Um, it's, a, it's a product that, that puts a monomolecular layer of, of uh, protection over your pool and therefore keeps the evaporation from taking place and you know what evaporation needs heat so in the springtime or in the fall you put a little bit of this in your pool every week and your pool stays warm and yet you don't get all gummed up with stuff that, um, that is used to prevent this so where did we come up with that idea? We did. Another guy had the idea. But he didn't have the money. So we said, okay, we'll buy the patent from you for 50 or 100 grand. And we'll give you an ongoing royalty even though we own the patent. A really good deal for us and a really good deal for this person who would now go on to invent other things. And that's what they were good at. Okay. So it doesn't have to be your idea. It just has to be an idea that you can control and that other people can't, other companies can't just emulate. Because there's no, I mean, the other thing that I've done is I've always run a specialty business. 
our margins are about 70%. That gives us the money to spend on marketing, innovative programs, and developing new products. If it's a commodity business, okay, 30% doesn't leave a lot, an awful lot of money left over to reinvest and to market. By the way, I am hogging the stage because there are not, there are no questions. Go ahead. Um, how did you come across the, the product that, you, that started this natural natural? Okay, country? that's a good question. Uh, I was I was looking around. Um, I found this tiny little company that had um, the natural enzyme technology. They were using it for everything. They were dirt poor, and I decided to invest a couple hundred thousand dollars in the company, which was my seed money. I did. I became a, an executive vice president, and it turned out that they were crooks. So I was never going to get my $200,000 back, but they agreed to give me the sole and exclusive rights to the enzyme technology for use in swimming pools and spots. So I thought, you know what? I can start a company now because, because of the features and the benefits of the enzyme. So that's how I found it. So the first, was it the first? Uh company you started? Or like, was it the first as, as an entrepreneur, yes. Um, as I said, it, within Union Carbide, right. I became known as a turnaround artist, yes. which is an entrepreneur, but working in a big corporate environment. Yes. And you say that you turned around a whole bunch of companies. How did you go about that differently than others? Or what made you so good at doing that? Strategic planning. Um, Normally, when a company, now, you've got to look, and like I said, you've got to find out, is it crappy because it's being run crappy, or because the industry it's in is crappy, and then you just want to get out. But nine times out of ten, the industry is pretty good, and you can make money in it, but you've got to run it right. Running it right <coughs> involves putting together a strategic plan where you get rid of all the redundancies and resources. Um, you allocate power to the right people. And you just you basically put it together with it. I mean I'm I'm so sick and tired of hearing all these US uh, politicians say, well you know we can't raise the minimum wage because you know we go bankrupt. Oh. Nobody in our company makes a minimum wage. Everybody makes at least three to four times a day. I don't care if you sweep the floor. Um, we have health plans. We have cars. We have, you know, with all within reason. Um, if you run your business right, you can do the right thing by your people. Okay. I'm not here about. Sorry. So, continuing with your point of the term, uh, aspect of entrepreneurship, is there ever um, a consistent underlying factor that you see whenever there's a failing business, like a one thing that you immediately look at to see if that's the reason because it's common, or? Yeah, assets, use of resources. Like when I took over the Lindy Division in Canada, uh, there was a R&D facility in one part of town, there was, <laughs> The welding business was located in a beautiful new factory in another part of town, out near Malton, or near the, the, the airport. And then there were other facilities. I just smashed them all together, because we had the space. And I, right off the bat, I eliminated a million and a half dollars of operating expenses. That's kind of a common you know. Okay, by the way, it's 10.15, I'll summarize in five minutes and I'll let you guys go to your next class because I don't want to take too much time. Um, well, let me just end with this. Um, as 
There is a common vein also to running businesses ready. Uh, we never wanted to get into the packaging business, you know, where you, we developed the products, but and we, we owned all of our old bottle walls, very unusual, but we never actually had the operation to put the product into the bottle. Now, our principal facilities are in Syracuse, New York, and we used a company there called Syracuse Packaging International to do our bottle. About a year ago, we determined that they were on the verge of bankruptcy because they were running it really bad. And they were, they were just throwing resources around like crazy. So we ended up about four or five months ago buying that company. So we had another 50 employees, and we own, it's called Complete Packaging Solutions. Now, the employees in that plant were so downtrodden, the morale was so crappy, the plant was a mess. And when we bought it, we had our senior management interview every single employee, everybody, people that stuck before. Half an hour interview each. What do you want to do? What's... When we bought it, we immediately started to clean it up. And we got them to start cleaning it up. They used to show up in grungy old clothes. Now they work in uniforms. We gave everybody a uniform, and at the end of each week, we gave them a uniform. It says draw on it, or whatever. But all of a sudden, People are coming to work at that company and they are happy. They don't just come to work because they have to come to work. It's like, I wonder what the hell is going to happen today. The floor is going to be cleaner. Everything, you know, they're buying new equipment. So, the underlying thing, I said this when I started, always treat your employees with the credit and the respect that they're due because they are going to make you successful. So that's it guys. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions that I can't answer, ask your professor or <laughs> whatever. But thank you very much. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks. Great. Thank you.